Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on the wonders of wood chip uh, with Ben Raskin, who is probably the absolute expert on wood chip in the UK. That's just brought out a book. Um, I'm Susie Russell. I'm the coordinator of the CSA Network UK, and this webinar is part of a series funded by Farming the Future. We're really grateful to them for for their funding, enabling us alongside the Land Workers Alliance, the Organic Growers Alliance and Gaia's Seed Sovereignty Network to put on, this is the 15th in a series of 24 webinars that we've been doing since the beginning of 2021. Um, the next one, just to give you a heads up, is on UK fibre producing. Could you grow your own clothes? Uh, that's being hosted by the Land Workers Alliance and it's on Wednesday the 27th of April. So I will put a link in the chat to that later on. But for now, I, I will hand over to Ben. He's the head of horticulture at the Soil Association and also the chair of the Community Supported Agriculture Network UK. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, is my, am I showing up now? Is my presentation showing? It is. You could make it, it full screen. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. There we go. Lovely. I've got some weird box asking me about only the host or all panellists, so that's fine. Thank you very much for the introduction and lovely to see you all here. I've spotted quite a few uh, friends uh, that are here as well, uh, so that's nice. Uh, some of them as knowledgeable as I am, so I'm hoping that they'll contribute answers as well as questions during the, uh, during the Q&A. So yes, uh, Susie mentioned that I'm, I work at the Soil Association. Uh, I've worked, I guess, in horticulture now for nearly 30 years, uh, originally as a commercial uh, vegetable and a bit of fruit grower, um, and then more recently uh, as an advisor and writer. Uh, I do a lot of work as well on agroforestry at the moment uh, for both the Soil Association and also managing a 200 acre agroforestry project um, near Swindon, um, for uh, Helen Brown's farm uh, and some of the pictures you'll see during the presentation and a lot of my experience uh, and sort of inspiration I guess uh, for Woodchip came from the work that I've done uh, at the farm. So uh, I thought I would start by just talking about sort of how I got obsessed by Woodchip um, which I call my Woodchip inspiration. Um, so there's a few a few trials and a few people that really got me into it. One of them, Ian Tollis or Tolly, is on the call um, and has been experimenting with this for longer than I have. Um, and some of the the sort of stuff that he's been doing, I'll touch on during the work uh, during during the presentation. Um, but seeing the effect that the woodchip was having on his farm was a big push to me getting really obsessed by it. Um, similarly, Glyn Percival, who's a tree. Um, advisor and scientist researcher uh, we did some work around wood chip and scab disease in apples that was sort of slightly mind-blowing um, and the work that the organic research center did particularly sally westaway um, and joe smith around wood chip was was pretty great um, and there's also an american scientist called david granite stein who i refer to a bit in the book uh, who's done some really great work on orchard systems and, and mulches and woodchip mulches particularly and looking at the, the relative uh, financial impact of different mulching systems and, and how using woodchip actually, although it's expensive to, to put on, can make a big difference and, and you get that money back from increased cropping. So, so when you're using it in a more commercial centre, it, it makes a lot of sense. So if we if we sort of go right back to the beginning, um, and where does woodchip come from? And obviously it comes from wood. Um, that's a picture of my two children who can't resist climbing up a pile of wood when they see one. Um, it's a relatively recent material in some ways. It was, uh, the first wood chipper was invented in 1884 by a, a German chap called Peter Jensen. Um, and he invented it to deal with the prunings that were coming out of the local parks. Uh, history doesn't sort of recall what he actually did with his wood chips, um, but the company does still make machines to this day. So uh, it's obviously a successful business. And any part really of a tree can be chipped or any of the top bits of the tree can be chipped or, or shredded with the right piece of kit. 
you know, I mean, you could do it with a pair of secretaires and a sledgehammer in your back garden if you only had a few bits. But obviously, at any scale, um, you need something uh, heavy duty. Um, and, you know, right up from those sort of rather pathetic little electric things that just deal with shreddings in back gardens, right up to mega monster machines that will just take a whole tree and, and chip it up in a matter of moments and everywhere in between. And we can talk a little bit um, about sort of what's appropriate and, and, you know, what bit of kit you need for what job. <clears throat> I have to say I'm not an expert on that, um, but as a general rule, hiring in a bigger piece of uh, a bigger shred or a bigger chipper would be my advice rather than than buying one because you're always going to be limited by uh you know by the the size of the stuff that affordable shredders can, and chippers can take so uh, i came to wood chip originally as, as i suspect most people did through using it as a mulch um probably on paths or around you know trees or shrubs in, in landscaping, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, it's certainly still one of the most effective uses of wood chip. Um, so I'm going to start with, with that and I'm going to look at a few ways in which it, it helps <clears throat> or, or it's useful. So we'll, we'll look a bit at weeds, water, temperature modulation, preventing splash, um, and I'll put vol control. I mean, we can, it, I'll widen it slightly to sort of pest and disease control, um, but, but we've seen interesting results with voles. So if we start with weeds, <coughs> excuse me, um, there's, there's a number of ways in which a mulch will control weeds. Um, so obviously it prevents light from getting through and it's most basic, uh, it prevent, you know, creates a barrier between the sun and the plant. Uh, but with a wood chip mulch, there's other stuff going on as well. So, so one of the things that, particularly if you use a fresh wood chip mulch, uh, is that it will inhibit the germination of annual weed seeds and, and other seeds on that mulch. So if, if something lands on you know, a lovely seed bed, it's perfect conditions, it germinates and grows away. If it lands on a lump of wood, um, that dries out very quickly, then it's not going to germinate. Um, and then some species of wood chip also will, particularly when they're fresh, will contain uh, chemicals, allopathic chemicals that, that also inhibit germination. So you've got the physical effect of, of it not being a nice surface to grow on and the chemical effect of actually uh, of inhibiting germination in the seed. Obviously, as the mulch uh, compost or decomposes. So the one that you can see in the picture here is sort of semi-rotted. That effect, um, you know, the chemical and physical will decrease and eventually you're actually creating a lovely seedbed for annual weed. So it is a, it's a temporary mulch in that sense. Um, the, uh, you quite often get questions about, you know, which is the best wood chip to use and, you know, how, how do I, what, how do I go about getting the right wood chip? Well, actually, mostly we can't choose what wood chip we get anyway, because most of us are relying on wood chip, I would say, from tree surgeon things where it's a bit mixed. Uh, and broadly speaking, I think it doesn't matter too much. They will all do a good job. Um, and as they get older, they'll do a less good job of weed control. But they're obviously at that point starting to do a better job of adding to your soil health. So, you know, you might decide to top up um, the mulch with a with a fresh layer, um, but equally you probably don't want to be doing that forever because it can uh, it can mess around sometimes with your nutrient levels in the soil. So, There's a question here, Ben, about yeah. um, somebody's got willow hybrid willow, and they're asking yeah. is that suitable as a mulch? And then if they put it down around um, brassicas, um, how long after that will it be suitable for seeding into? Oh, quite a lot of questions there. Uh, I mean, broadly speaking, willow is, yes, very suitable as a mulch. Um, and I'll come on to specifically willow um, and it's uh, the, the salicylic acid, the wonder of salicylic, salicylic acid in, in willow. Um, in terms of spreading it around brassicas, I would say I wouldn't generally mulch vegetable plants with fresh wood chip. I think, although we'll come on to nitrogen robbing, there is a risk of nitrogen robbing. It's not anything like as much as it's claimed to be, but there is a risk. 
um, and generally I would tend not to use uh, a lot of fresh wood chip as a mulch on vegetables, uh, I would compost it first. Um, so I hope that sort of answers that question. Um, I will, yeah, so in terms of the weed control, um, the, oh, just one other thing about, yeah, the willow question. So, so one of the things is that the different woods will rot in, in, at a different rate. So willow, for instance, it grows very quickly. It's quite a soft wood. It, it breaks down very quickly as well. So it doesn't give you a very long lasting mulch. Whereas something like oak or hornbeam um, will, which are much harder woods, will take a lot longer to break down. So if you're looking for a long lasting mulch that you only have to do say once and it will last for two or three years, then going with a, a harder tree species is more effective. The one thing to say about weed control um, is that while chip is good for annual weeds, it is not it won't control perennial weeds. Um, um, it has very little control for perennial weeds. Um, so this is a picture of the creeping thistle finding its way through what was quite a deep wood chip mulch. Um, and of course, what you've done is you've removed all the competition. So when they do get up through the wood chip mulch, they, they're lovely, they, they're mulch themselves. So their roots are all nice and moist and, and fertile. And so of course they then, that, what, what you see in this picture very quickly turned into that, which is a, a sea of creeping thistle in seed. Um, now in amongst there, this is, this is a picture from Eastbrook Farm, in amongst there, there is a row of trees stretching along there. The trees will be fine and had a, you know, they had a good mulch, they got established, they'll grow through it. Um, it's a bit messy um, in a, this is a grazed system, so it's not a massive problem, but if you were in a crop system, you probably would not want all of that seed floating into your uh, vegetable or arable system. So, so a little word of warning, I guess, about, about perennial weeds and some growers uh, combined strategies. So they'll put on a wood chip mulch and then they might flame weed over the top of it or they might cultivate it uh, after a year or two to get rid of the, the weeds that are done. So, so thinking about, as with anything, you know, there isn't often one solution that will do everything. So thinking about it as part of an integrated uh, weed control is, is probably worthwhile. And, and one of the things that David Granistein looked at was comparing the cost and efficiency of different mulching systems. So he looked at herbicides and plastic mulches and flame weeding and cultivation. Um, and broadly, you know, spraying is the cheapest way of controlling weeds, but it doesn't give you any moisture control and it doesn't give you any soil health benefits. Uh, being on a wood chip or a compost mulch is one of the most expensive ways of controlling weeds, but um, the the establishment the speed of establishment of the trees and sometimes the speed of uh, fruiting so they'll sometimes fruit a year or two earlier if they if they grow really well and, and mature really well uh, and then the increased yields from those trees will will more than make up for the extra cost of spreading the wood chip from from the trials that he did so we've got a question here from sue johnson that kind of relates to that which is regarding soil and crop health how does wood chip compare to herbaceous mulches for example straw hemp hay or compost so the, the short answer is not that much work has been done on it uh there are there is some stuff so generally it's a longer lasting um organic matter than say straw um so because the lignins in wood are more complex structure and a harder structure than annual plants, the, the organic matter will break down more slowly. So effectively, you've got a longer term uh, organic amendment. Um, and there's also, there is research looking at the uh, reduced, looking at sort of the leaching of nutrients from different beddings. So, so where you compare a bedding, that uh, a wood chip bedding, where the, the cows have been bedded on wood chip, you will get less leaching than you would from a straw bedded system. So, so there is evidence that they hold on to nutrients, other nutrients better than other materials. And I think there was a question in the original chat about mixing manure and wood chip. And it's a really good way of maximizing the benefits of both of those materials. So if you're using 
manure on its own the you will likely lose quite a lot of particularly the nitrogen nitrogen but also some of the phosphorus because it will be leached out where you mix it with wood chip it holds on to those nutrients and binds them for a longer time and then they get gradually released over time so it's a really it's a really good way of maximizing it and there are even some um, conventional farmers that are mixing artificial nitrogen with wood chip um, to reduce the leaching of artificial nitrogen um, so yeah um, that's a good question but I think, you know more work I think still needs to be done on those comparisons but but generally I'd say the main benefit from it is that it's it's a it's a more complex material I think it will build the soil fungi more than some of those other composting materials um, but it doesn't mean that the other things are, are bad or that you shouldn't use them um, again mixing materials can be a good way of doing it as well so if we go on to water retention, this photo is was the, the, actually the main catalyst to me writing the book. Um, so what you see in this picture is um, a, a field of trees that we planted in 2017-18, so that winter just before the drought year of 2018. Um, and off to the right, out of the photo, there's some pollarded willows so we, we cut down a whole load of big old willows that hadn't been pollarded for ages and we created a big pile of wood chip which we threw over the fence and it landed around these trees and I had every intention of moving it and mulching the other trees properly with it and we never got around to it so these trees on the left the small ones had a very small sprinkling of wood chip from somewhere else and the trees on the right had about two and a half foot three foot of mulch they were all planted on the same day. So that tree and that tree were planted literally on the same day. They're the same stock from the same nursery. The ones on the left, uh, four years later, are still probably just above my waist. And the ones on the right are about 12 foot tall. Um, and that, I think, uh, I mean, as you know, I, had, I don't know exactly, but I think it's mainly down to the water retention properties in that very drought year on a species, willow, that is, um, you know, particularly prone to drying out. So it really benefited from having that moisture. There may, there may have been a temperature benefit as well, but I think the main thing was water retention. Um, and there's lots of studies looking at mulching and, and soil moisture, and they tend to show um, about a 25% uh, increase in soil moisture if you have a 10 to 15 centimeter layer of mulch uh, or, or you know, a reduction of 25% in irrigation needs, for instance. Um, the thicker the mulch, the more it will hold the water in uh, up to a point. Um, so with, as with anything, it's a balance of how much mulch have you got, how much time have you got to spread it, how many trees or plants are you, are you trying to mulch um, but certainly from this experiment uh, it would seem that having a really really deep mulch helped um, and uh, it's quite striking so the temperature modulation was something that I hadn't really thought about until I started researching for the book um, and most plants don't thrive in extreme temperatures um, you know so they might survive but they don't tend to like it really cold or really hot and in the same way most soil organisms are most active uh, at about 25 to 30 degrees centigrade um, so the fungi can cope a bit better with colder temperatures and bacteria can cope a bit better with hot temperatures but but broadly speaking all of them prefer to be in that sort of mid-range temperature and a mulch, and particularly a wood chip mulch, will uh, help to modulate that temperature. So it will keep the soil cooler in hot weather, and particularly it slows down how quickly it heats up. So in the morning, if you've got really hot sun beating down, it will, it will delay the heating up of the soil um, for, for a few hours. And then in, in cold weather, it can keep the soil warm, um, you know, up to 10 degrees warmer with a thick mulch. So there's a real, opportunity to protect the biology in your soil by using by using mulches as well as of course as feeding that biology with the organic matter. The so probably most of you have, have 
noticed when you if you've got bare soil and really heavy rain particularly if you've got sort of big big drops of rain when it hits the bare soil it splashes back up um, and the bottoms of your plants can get all a bit sort of muddy and, and splashy and in amongst all of that mud is a lot of disease spore and then once they land on the soil on the plant if they're sort of in this muddy stuff all over the all over the leaf then that's a perfect environment for them to um to grow and and you can you know you can get problems with disease around the bottom of, of plants uh, a mulch will not only stop um the splashing but it reduces the disease so there was a, a trial in america with box plants so there's a when when you trim box hedges um they get particularly susceptible to box blight um uh, and because also you tend to have them cut low to the ground as well. Um, so they did a trial with a mulch and they saw a 97% decrease in disease on the plants when they had a wood chip mulch. Um, and there were two things I think was happening. One was, so they put the mulch down after the leaves had, had dropped. So although box is evergreen, there is, a, there is some leaf drop in the autumn. So they put the mulch on after that, which created a physical barrier between the disease spores and the plants. And then also when it rained, it, it stopped some of the splashing and the splashing that did happen was effectively clean water back from the wood chip. And with rain becoming increasingly heavy, I would say with climate change, we, we tend to be getting rain less often, but more of it. Uh, this could be a really useful property. Um, and of course, you know, the, the mulch will protect the soil surface anyway and, and to sort of help reduce some of that surface compaction and damage that you get from driving and walking on, on the soil. And then pests is a, is a nice little volume. looks quite sweet there, doesn't he? Munching away at his worm. Um, but I'm sure a lot of you have suffered vole damage and particularly on newly planted trees. What we found, we did initially, we did quite a lot of uh, experimenting with mulch mats. Um, which I've come to hate with a passion. Uh, I think they, apart from the fact they're really fiddly to put down, you've got to peg them in and then you, what do you use? You've got to use these plastic pegs that stick in the soil forever. Or you're trying to use, you know, wooden stakes and they're always breaking. And then once they're in, they create a lovely protected environment for the voles who make their home under this little nice waterproof roof and they nibble away at the roots of your trees underneath. And then if you mulch on top of them, you're insulating their house for them. So they've got a lovely warm house that they can live in under uh, near the tree roots and, and nibble away at it. What we've found where we put the wood chip directly on the soil around the trees and not using a mat is that we didn't get any vault damage. Um, and I think that probably what's happening is it's falling into their uh, into the runs. They don't they don't like it. It's probably it's not creating a a covered environment so they're more vulnerable to um to attack from predators if you imagine you've got this clean wood chip space around the tree if they go on that they're going to be visible and, and vulnerable and it seems that they they keep away from the tree roots and find other stuff to eat um, in the pasture so although we have lots and lots of voles we haven't seen uh very much vole damage at all where we've mulched directly onto the soil uh, and then in terms of some of the other pests and disease, I think there's, <clears throat> there's very little work has been done on single species wood chips. And I think that's probably the big area for research. We did, as part of the Innovative Farmers um, Programme, we did a trial with willow wood chip. Um, and this was something that Glyn Percival had noticed in a previous trial, that the, the apple trees that had been mulched with willow seemed to have less scab on them. And we wanted to see if we could replicate that um, in, in orchard situations. So we worked with some cider growers down in, in Somerset. Um, and we did see a trend to, to re reduce scab in those that had been mulched with willow. It wasn't conclusive. Um, the, the theory is that the salicylic acid seems to stimulate an immune reaction in, uh, in the plants in the same way that when we take aspirin, it, it helps us recover. Um, the, there's no reason, uh, Glenn thinks, why that effect wouldn't also happen on other diseases. So we happen to be looking at scab, but um, you know it, it's quite possible it would work on other diseases. 
the reason he thinks we didn't see such uh, a conclusive result as he'd hoped was a, a number of things potentially. So one is that there is uh, significantly different levels of salicylic acid in different willow species um, and not all of the trialists were using ones with the highest levels. So cho choice of willow species is, is crucial. Timing is also crucial. Uh, so you have to cut it in February or sort of now-ish, February, March, when the, when the growth is just starting and the, the salicylic acid levels are highest in the chip. Um, and then you have to use it within a couple of weeks because it's quite soluble. So you want to get the chip on the ground around the tree so that it leaches out into the root system of the tree rather than sort of wherever you're storing the pile of chip. And then the final reason was uh, he doesn't think that some of the growers put enough chip around their trees and the growers were nervous uh, because cider apples are collected mostly by machine. So they're sort of swept off the ground and they didn't want lots of wood chip coming up in the machine. So they didn't put as much on as he recommended sometimes. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely opportunities to do some more work on that. And then there was another really interesting um, study looking at using uh, a wood chip mulch to help reduce, uh, I think it was, uh, um, oh, I can't remember the pest name in apples anyway, one of the apple pests uh, and the, the larvae from this pest loved overwintering in the wood chip. So you think well, that's slightly counterintuitive. You put the wood chip down, you're actually encouraging the, the pest, but actually what they were then able to do was treat the pest with a biological control. And it was much more effective when they treated the, the mulch than when they tried to treat the soil, which the, the um, larvae would otherwise have been in. Um, so they had a much, much better uh, hit rate on the on the larvae and reduced the pest levels significantly. So that's using the, the physical properties of the of the mulch uh, in a sort of integrated pest management kind of way. So so there's lots. I think there's lots still to explore with how we use wood chip to uh, to help us in our in our control of pests and diseases. So if we sort of widen us, are there any, sorry Susie, you've just jumped back in, but I've just about to change tack slightly away from the mulches. Are there any other questions there that's worth um Yeah, we've got a, we've got a couple. One was just um, that research you were talking about comparing mulches. Is, is that actually happening anywhere that you know of? Uh, the, the stuff I mentioned from America is that the, I, I don't know. So. Yeah, I don't know if it's happening now. It was a study from a few years back um i can uh i mean I, the, I can put a link i can put a link in after this i'll i'll give you a link susie to send out to everybody right um, but yeah david granite stein is the chap's name and there's a really he's done a really good um powerpoint presentation that you can find online um that's got a lot of the information in so brilliant and then there was a question um about whether you'd advocate for spreading wood chip on newly planted two-year-old apple trees for water retention. Yes, I would. That was an easy one. And then, when mulching around trees, do you leave a small clear circumference around the bottom to prevent rot, especially on trees that have been grafted? Yes, also yes. Um, it, the, if you, uh, yeah, if I go back just quickly to, um, to, uh, that picture you'll notice in that picture that I haven't done that um, the because they're willows I think it didn't matter because willows will root basically up the whole stem but for most trees absolutely you need to leave a little well around the, the stem to stop them rotting so yeah and then we've got a, a question can you recommend using wood bark Yes, I mean, wood bark will have a similar effect um, it will be it might it might work slightly differently um, in the sense that, you know, it's a slightly different chemical makeup, but it will still work as a mulch uh, and it will still add to your organic matter. So there's definitely nothing wrong with with using bark, um, but it's not. It's just, yeah, it's just a different part of the tree. So, yeah. That's it on questions for now, but I'll, I'll jump in if any others appear. Right. So if we if we broaden out slightly from just the mulch, um, 
it's worth thinking about once that wood breaks down what does what does it do for your soil you know how is it useful um so i'd start by looking at worms and again um visiting tolly's farm uh, was just incredible with this um he as part of the some of the uh, trials he did with the organic research center they actually counted uh, his worms in his soil and I think I'm right in saying, if I've got my figures right, Tolly can always correct me in the chat, but if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, he, his estimate is that he's got more than 3 million worms an acre. So that's, you know, that's kind of tons of the things. And it's actually, it's much higher than Darwin estimated in his original uh, treatise on earthworms, which is still very worthwhile reading um, and, and very relevant. So, so we know that, uh, that adding, uh, wood chip soil will help your worms as you know there's other studies that there's a Canadian and a study that also showed uh, that worm populations increased um, when you add uh, when you add particularly rainmill wood chip or composted wood chip and even in the 1950s there was a study that showed a, a threefold increase in earthworms when you when you added hardwood chips so there's lots of evidence that that it will help your um, your worm count and this picture here, I mean, this surprised me. So the, if you look at the, the wood chip in this picture, it's not very broken down. Um, there's still some quite big chunks of, of relatively fresh wood chip in there. And this pile of chip is on a concrete pad. It's not even on the soil. But already, you know, the worms were coming in in quite big numbers into it. Um, and, and I've sometimes heard people go, oh, don't put um, wood chip in your, in your wormery. It, you know, they hate it. They hate it. But I, again, I suspect it's about, um, you know, the quantity and the type of wood chip, maybe, maybe someone's put fresh cedar wood or chip in or something where it's got a, a chemical that the worms don't like, but certainly composted wood chip is no problem at all to worms. And even, even looking at that photo, even relatively fresh wood chip. Um, and, you know, there are, there are occasional, um, the risk so for instance there was one study that showed that if you look around a walnut tree there's not as many worms because they've got this uh, juglone or juglone this sort of chemical allopathic chemical but i couldn't see much evidence that the wood chip on its own would have that effect um, and certainly all the evidence i've seen suggests that any of those potentially harmful chemicals in fresh wood chip break down pretty quickly within three to six months so so if you are worried about any particular sort of batch you've had or a particular species, then leaving it to compost for three to six months will almost certainly remove pretty much all the risk of, of, of harming anything in the soil. And the other big thing, obviously, a uh, big benefit of, uh, of wood chip is that it will build your soil fungi. So wood chip is mostly broken down by fungi rather than bacteria bacteria are not strong enough to break into the, the woody leg, lignin cells uh, and, and, and they also need higher levels of nitrogen. Fungi are able to function on much lower levels of nitrogen. They do need some um, and that's why uh, you know you, you, this way you get this nitrogen robbing occasionally so the, the fungi will sort of scavenge around a little bit for, for nitrogen to help them. Um, but you know obviously <clears throat> you know if you see a big old trunk which has virtually no nitrogen in, uh, mushrooms will still get in there and start to break it down. So they can cope with very low levels of nitrogen. There's a question here on whether there's any work on treating the wood chip with indigenous microorganisms to stimulate the fungi and bacterial breakdown. Uh, ah, the, what I think there might have been actually, um, but effectively what you're doing by chipping it is you're speeding that process up anyway. So, um, fungi or any organisms that are breaking wood down find it much easier to get in through a cut or broken bit of wood so you know a tree by its nature has evolved to keep things out so if it's a, a trunk with the bark on you know it's pretty impregnable um, and it will take year, you know sometimes years for, for fungi or, or other organisms to break in through the outside of that bark and that trunk and break it down by chipping it effectively, you're cutting. It's like you know, you're you're creating a fast food or a baby food for, for the fungi. You're chopping it up into little bits. You're making it easy to digest. You're you're providing lots of entry points for 
for spores and organisms to break it down. Um, so, so I would say you don't need to treat it probably. I think there's so much stuff in the atmosphere that's going to come in and do it anyway. And it's, and it's probably, it's the breaking up of that that's doing the, the speeding up rather than, um, rather than inoculating it with anything. Um, adding a bit of green or a bit of nitrogen will also speed that process up. You don't need it. It will break down without it, but it can also speed that process up. Um, but yeah, it, it'll break down basically uh, once you've chipped it. The, uh, and, and, you know, building soil carbon, you've got the wood itself, obviously, is adding some carbon, some organic matter to the soil. But fungi and mushrooms are also able to, to sequester their own carbon and fix their own carbon. So they bring actually loads of carbon in through that increased fungal material as well. So it's just a really good thing to be doing. And, and I'm sure a lot of you have come across this concept of the, the fungal and bacterial ratio in soils. So soils, when they're very young, you know, so on a, when a volcano erupts and you get sort of raw molten lava that cools and hardens, nothing grows on it initially. And then, you know, bacteria and lichen comes in, they start to break down some of that mineral and then eventually you get little plants growing, um, but it's still, it's very bacterial dominated. As the plants get bigger and drop their leaves and you build up a depth of soil, that's when the, the sort of the woody plants and the fungi start to come in. And for a lot of our plants, um, they prefer sort of slightly fungal dominated soil, particularly shrubs and trees. Uh, and the more we cultivate soils and grow things in them or spray them, the more we're killing off fungi. So they, Arable soils, particularly horticultural soils, tend to move away from that fungal domination towards a more bacterial soil. And by, it, by putting some, some of this wood chip back in and building up the fungal populations, you can, you can help the plants that are growing in it as well. Um, There's a question here, which you might be going to talk about later. It's about ramial wood chip and its particular benefits regarding nutrient availability and encouraging arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi. Is your experience that an average wood chip mix has much the same benefits as ramial wood chip? We will come on to that. Um, also would be, can we, can we hear from other people in this format or not? We can't, can we unmute people? We can't, I we can, can't. I can uh, ask, and um, yeah, I can make people panelists. So we could in the questions, it, yeah. Because it might well be worth hearing from Tolly because he's specifically done some of those um, comparisons using composted wood chip and ramial wood chip. So if, if he's willing to um, pitch in later, that'd be really interesting to hear. Um, Great, okay, we can do that. I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think there's evidence that shows the difference in terms of fungi. Um, I think that there's really only been two studies on ramial wood chip. We are coming to it later, but there's really only been two main studies, one in Canada and one that the Organic Research Centre did that um, Tolly and I were involved in. And we didn't particularly look at um, fungal populations, um, but Tolly may have some uh, observational stuff. Um, and I will cover nitrogen robbing at this point as well, because it does always come up. And it's one of the things I think that has limited the uptake of wood chip use. Um, so nitrogen robbing is where uh, you put wood chip on and it sucks the nitrogen from around it. And therefore the plants that are trying to grow in it go, oh, I haven't got enough nitrogen, I can't grow. Um, <clears throat> it does happen, it is a risk, um, but it's quite a minor risk in my opinion. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of things just to be really aware of to stop it happening. So the first is never dig in fresh wood chip. Um, so even ramial wood chip, which is much higher in nitrogen, I would not dig in. I'd always spread it on the surface. So what seems to happen is that where the, uh, so if I imagine that that's a bit of wood chip and it, where it touches the soil, is where it robs the nitrogen. Usually within, it seems to be within about a centimeter of where it touches the soil. So if you imagine you're just spreading it on the surface, it's, it's only gonna rob nitrogen from that top, let's say top one centimeter, maybe two centimeters of soil. So if you're growing, if you're mulching a tree, um, the tree roots are gonna be down a good foot once they start growing even more than that, they're not gonna be affected by that small loss of nitrogen in the top layer. 
where you'll see problems is where you dig it in. So if you know, if I dig all of these wood chip in and they're all over the surface of the soil, then obviously they're touching soil all around them and everything's touching. And that way they're going to be sucking nitrogen from where, as deep as you have you dug it into. So don't dig in fresh. Um, if you're at all worried, um, compost it. Because as soon as it's, you know, after six months or nine months, it will already have started breaking down. And although it might still need some nitrogen, it will also be releasing nitrogen as those organisms sort of breed and die and the materials broken down. Where I have seen problems is, uh, is I've mulched raspberries with wood chip. And I think because they're very shallow rooted, I think they did get affected. Um, and I've heard other people saying actually they've had problems uh, mulching raspberries with wood chip as well. Uh, so, so there are, I think, you know, I wouldn't put them on shallow rooted veg. I wouldn't put uncomposted wood chip on shallow rooting veg, for instance. So, so it's just being aware of how it might react. Um, and the other big no-no is, um, is using sawdust or, you know, as a, as a mulch, because that's, in a way, you've, you've massively increased the surface area of that material by grinding up small. Uh, and it's usually, if it's from a sawmill, for instance, it will be really dead, really old wood. It will have no nitrogen in it at all. Um, and, and, you know, some of the really big problems you see will come from using sawdust. But generally, as long as you don't dig it in, um, or you or you compost it, you should be fine and not see nitrogen rubbing. So some of you I know are on a on a sort of slightly bigger scale. I mean we've done a, a lot of moving wood chip about with wheelbarrows and trailers, um, and and it's actually you know it's not the worst way to do it. It's, it's a relatively light material. I would always use a bit of manure fork to spread it rather than a shovel. It's so much easier because um, it, it sort of goes into the pile really easily. Uh, and on a, you know, on even a sort of, you know, anything up to sort of a few acres, actually, if you've got a front loading tractor and you can load the trailer mechanically, then spreading it by hand is is not a bad call you get to put it exactly where you want it um <clears throat> and you know you can you can drive to where it's got to go but you know where you're planting in any scale it's worth thinking about how we mechanize um uh, so this picture here is part of a 400 meter row of trees that we were putting in um and we ended up using a feed wagon so what the farmers normally would use to put out their silage for the cattle and we slightly adapted it with a slightly longer shoot and we mulched 400 meters in uh well if you include loading it up we did it in about three quarters of an hour so it was pretty quick we then just had to quickly rake it across to the other side we started off doing it up one and down the other side so it was on both sides um, but actually then decided it was quicker just to do one side and quickly rake around each tree. Um, obviously, the problem you can see here is that we've wasted quite a lot of mulch. So, you know, we actually only need to mulch that area around the tree and we've mulched all of that area between it as well. I think for us, it was still the right decision. It still made it so much quicker. Um, but there's, there's challenges uh, with mechanization as well as, as advantages. Um, and, you know, there's a few ways of doing it. So there's, there's some really nice side spreading, um, side discharge mulches that you can buy. These, I mean, these two uh, are American, um, but there's a company Seymour's in the UK that makes one. The last time I looked, it was about 18,000 pounds. So we decided not to buy it. Um, I've tried lots of different ways as well. So in the bottom right, this is at Eastbrook where we basically take the JCB and we dump piles around the field and then we spread it by hand the last few bits. So a lot of the time gets wasted moving the chip to where you want it to be. So if you can if you can move big loads of it and then just do the final bit spreading it around by hand, that really helps. Um, <clears throat> the I've also used the side tipping dumper truck, which was quite fun. You kind of, you know, you tip it a bit, tip it a bit, and it won't come out, it won't come out, and then suddenly the old tree's covered in wood chip mulch. 
so sort of having it as a two-man job with one person guiding it or, or sort of putting it on can work quite well uh what else yeah i mean you could for, for, for small stuff you can have um you know you can have a rear discharge um muck spreader as well which could spread it uh, as you go along uh, obviously as soon as plants get a bit bigger that's a problem so it's not not ideal for trees um, but it depends yeah it depends on your application obviously any sort of muck spreaders and things like that can be adapted for the wood chip as well um, but particularly for trees getting it sort of neatly along the row is is the trick this is not probably directly relevant to most of you uh I, well i would hope it's not directly relevant to most of you but it's quite interesting uh, this is a uh, it's from america and we've got we've got is a big field of conventional maize um and as a lot of maize production is they were having problems with leaching um so they decided that the way to solve this was to build a bioreactor and they basically dug a massive pit in the corner of the field where the runoff was happening and filled it with wood chip um, and they saw a huge reduction in leaching and then every two or three years they dig out the wood chip and replace it with fresh wood chip. Um, personally I would probably change the farming system but, um, but it, it was interesting to see you know what's a relatively low-tech solution to, to, to the problem. And I mentioned earlier about how, you know, wood chip does have this great ability to hold on to those nutrients and release them more slowly. So they're creating, a, you know, what it would be a very useful material from that. So there's been quite a lot of talk about rain meal wood chip. Um, just in case any of you don't know what it is, it's, um, it's the chip that comes from small branches. So branches that are less than seven centimetres in diameter. Uh, it's more biologically active. It's got, because there's more bark to dead material, uh, there's more nitrogen, there's more nutrients. Um, you know, particularly if it's got the leafy stems, <clears throat> there's quite a lot of green material in there. Uh, and it seems that you can spread it directly on the soil or on your green manure without it causing any nitrogen lockup problems. And you know, giving the advantages that we've talked about in terms of building soil health, fungi, etc. Um, the obviously the beauty of this is that you don't need to chip it, take it away, compost it, bring it back. Um, you know, you take a lot of the operations out of the equation. It also would make use of a material that is not useful for other things, particularly. So a lot of wood has other demands on it whether it's you know at the moment obviously wood chip is hugely in demand for biomass but you know even for timber and you know other things there's there's, there's lots of uses we can put our trees to but the small stuff the brash the the trimmings the that come off during that process generally haven't had um a use or a market so they tend you know some of it's gone into to landfill in the past which is terrible uh, you know, other, some other times it's just been burnt. So a lot of forestry operations, they just make a big bonfire and, and get rid of it that way. But actually, if we could if we could chip it and just spread it in situ, then that would be a brilliant way of, of harnessing that resource and using it to build um, our our soil. And and from my point of view, in terms of uh, agroforestry systems, actually thinking about how we uh create a, a system where you get the benefit of the tree when it's growing so you know it might be for, for biodiversity or for, for shelter and shade or feeding livestock but then you can <clears throat> uh, coppice it um and and turn it into chip and spread it on the soil around there to me that seems a, a perfect way of, of building a system and and reducing your need for inputs um you know really thinking about it as that whole farm uh, plan. So as I mentioned, there's really only two studies really being done. There was a seminal work in the 80s in Canada, um, which sort of highlighted the opportunities. And then kind of strangely, really not much since um, until the Organic Research Centre did their WOOFS project, which was the wood chip for fertile soils, I think I'm right in saying. 
um, which uh, trialled spreading wood chip on three different farms. So, so Tolly was one of them, Wakeland's agroforestry farm was another, uh, and then there was a, a conventional arable farmer in Hampshire who also ran a wood chip, uh, you know, a wood recycling business. So, so he had all the, the equipment to spread it. Um, and the results basically showed that it gave advantages and didn't seem to give any disadvantages. Um, so it was, you know, it was positive in that sense, but, but equally a lot more study needed in terms of the actual benefits and the long term benefits. You know, there were some odd little things came up. Um, so I remember, I think Tolly said that year two, he saw one crop suddenly didn't seem to be doing so well with the rain mule, but then, you know, it was hard to tell exactly what that meant. So there's still lots more work to be done on it, um, but I would say it's pretty low risk in terms of, uh, you know, it, I almost certainly will give benefits. Um, and you can see from this picture, you don't, you know, when you're putting on soil, you're not putting a lot on. It's not a sort of massive mulch. It's, you know, it's, it's as if you're spreading muck. It's a, it's a sort of soil amendment. It's a boost. You're not looking for the fertility or mulching particularly. Um, and and I know that Tolly sort of recommends putting it on during the fertility building phase of the rotation. Um, but uh, Richard, the, the farmer in Hampshire, actually was putting it onto bare soil before planting and didn't see any ill effects. Um, so, yeah, re lots of potential, I think, but, but understudied. We've got a question here from Chloe, who's, who's one of the growers at Real Veg TSA at Wakeland. She's asking, how quickly do you need to use freshly chipped rain meal to gain the benefits before it degrades? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know is the short answer. Um, the, the risk of leaving it is that you just lose stuff into the air. You know, you'll lose some of the carbon, you'll lose um, <clears throat> some of the nitrogen will get leached, you know, if it's not covered. Um, so I would say the sooner you put it on, the better. Um, you know, I think in an ideal situation, you literally spread it as you chip it. Um, but I don't think that means that if you've got a pile that's been sat there for a while, it's not any good. Um, it will still, you know, it will still give you lots of the benefits that adding any wood chip will give to soil. Um, but it might not be as biologically active, I guess. I don't know is the short answer. Um, be interested if anyone else has any thoughts on the, on the chat. But. Another question from Chloe is whether you could put fresh rain meal directly onto veg beds and whether it would be beneficial. So that's a good question, and I think might lead me to my next slide. No, it doesn't. I'm going to jump because of that question. I'm going to jump ahead. Um, so this is uh, a picture from uh, Scotland um, uh, from Al, and I can't quite remember the name of his business off the top of my head. Um, but he, so you can see the snow on the ground. So he's been creating raised beds um, and. Uh, putting rain meal wood chip on as a mulch. I don't know how well that worked, is the short answer. I think um, I think because it's going on in winter, it's already got a bit of a chance to break down before you plant anything into it. So I think it would be fine. I have to say my instinct generally would be to compost wood chip before putting it on raised beds or on around veg. Um, but equally, I'd be really interested in doing some experiments with putting rain meal on fresh and seeing what happens. Um, and again, I suspect it depends a little bit on the crop. So my guess is that something like squash would cope quite well, whereas, um, you know, something like radish might struggle. <laughs> um, not that you'd mulch radish, but you know what I mean. It's, so it's, uh, there's probably some crops that would be fine and others that might not be. Um, but I'd love to see some more, some more experiments using, you know, using rain meal wood chip in a whole range of systems. Right, let me go back to Fred. Fred and his hotbed. So Fred Bonnestru, some of you will know, who's another one of my, uh, my inspirations. Um, he's done quite a lot with uh, wood chip as well. But one of the things he's done is create these hotbeds using wood chip. So the concept of the hotbed is, you know, is, well, millennia old, the Romans were using it. Um, you know, you capture the heat given off by, usually it's been rotting manure um, and you use it to grow things that 
either more quickly or things that are more tender. So for what Fred's done is he's using it for his propagation unit. Uh, and what he's found with the wood chip is that it gives a longer lasting and more even heat than manure. Um, so, so manure will heat up more quickly and get hotter, um, but then it, would, it also seems to cool down more quickly, whereas the wood chip, and again, he's using Ramiel wood chip with the higher nitrogen content. The wood chip heats up a little bit more slowly, but stays at an even temperature. He sort of gets it up to about 20, 25 degrees and lasts long enough for him to do all of his propagation. Um, and then obviously once it's composted that during that time you can then spread it you know he then just sort of spreads it on the beds in the tunnel so it's all in the right place and um, so it's great if you know if you don't have electricity it's a really great way of creating a um, heated propagation space and speaking of propagation uh, again this was something that I hadn't considered initially with wood chip um, but that Polly had been experimenting with um, and we did another innovative farmers trial with him and we looked, uh, it was leeks and brassicas and we trialed them uh, between <coughs> his own homemade wood chip compost and leading based compost of Carson's peak compost. Uh, and we also put biochar in both of those, so there were four different treatments. Uh, and basically his compost performed as well as the based uh, commercial compost. So there's really no difference between the germination and the performance of the seedlings. Uh, the only significant difference there that we saw was that the compost with wood chip and biochar had lower leak rust in the crops when they were harvested. So they, they sort of monitored the crops from the trial as well. Um, and Again, I mean, it's hard to know exactly why, but possibly it's because they were more biologically active. Um, and so the, the plant was a bit healthier and able to get going quicker or able to resist the disease when it came in. But effectively, what Tolly has shown is that you can you can produce what is a relatively low tech, easy thing to produce. You can do it on farm from, from simple ingredients and you can create something that, you know, is is as good as buying a really good commercial product in. Um, and he's done the, the economics on it as well, and it works out similar in price if you sort of factor in all of your labor and all the rest of it. I mean, my, my guess is actually since we've done that trial, the price of compost might have gone up, so it might actually even be cheaper than how to make your own. I don't know if I've done that, but. Um, so yeah, so it was a really interesting trial. That picture on the left is his strawberries. Um, and as you can see, you know, they look fantastic. Um, and the pitch on the right is, is, is uh, Fred's actually, where he's just planted some squashes into the piles that are waiting. Um, so even while you, you know, if you're composting wood chip, while it's sat there composting, you can still use it. You can grow things in it. Um, and, and, you know, certain crops will grow really, really well um, just in the, in the composting wood chip, not to mention mushrooms as well, of course. Uh, no, I'm trying to remember where I've got, I haven't got a picture of <clears throat> the method. So I will just quickly explain how Tolly makes the compost. So, uh, so he gets good quality um, wood chip from a tree surgeon. So it is important to have a good relationship with your tree surgeon. We've got three tree surgeons at Eastbrook that drop stuff off. Um, and two of them are really good and it's really good quality. And one of them we occasionally get tree trunks and. You know, we've even had the odd chainsaw helmet and thing left in there. Um, so, you know, making sure that your tr the tree surgeon understands what you want is, is helpful. That might get harder. Um, you know, I have heard that uh, in certain parts of the country, it's getting harder to get hold of free wood chip. Um, and, you know, as it becomes, I think it will become more in demand. Uh, it's possible that, it, you, you know, you get less say in, in, in what you get. Um, but most of it's fine. It's, it's what you don't want is you don't want, you know, old pallets chipped up or anything with paint on, um, <clears throat> you know, or, or big lumps of stuff. So it's, you know, it's really just being able to talk to the tree surgeon and understanding what's in it. Um, There's a question here. Um, does it matter if you use diseased wood as mulch, i.e. ash that's been infected by dieback? Guessing you wouldn't want to put dieback chip as a mulch around new ash trees, for example, when receiving okay. chip. Yeah, okay. I'll, 
I'll come back to that. If I if I finish, I'll quickly finish explaining how Tully makes his propagation compass, and I'll come back to disease because it's a good right. question. Um, so he he lays it out in. Uh, I feel slightly weird describing what Tully does when he's sitting on the call, but anyway, <laughs> he, he lays it out in windrows. Uh, he does add some of the uh, some of his pack house waste. So there's a little bit of vegetable waste in there, but it's a, it's really a relatively small part of it. Uh, he turns it a few times during the year, and that's just making sure that all of the chip sort of has a turn in a way of being in the middle of the heap and and gets composted. Uh, then most of that chip he'll spread out on the field as uh, you know as that soil amendment that we mentioned earlier. But a small proportion of it he'll pile up for another six months, so it gets eighteen months altogether. <clears throat> um, and then by the time it's got to that stage. It basically looks like compost anyway. It needs sieving because there's a few sort of bigger lumps of wood in there. Effectively, at that point, you sieve it, uh, and you can use it almost, you know, as it is. I think Tolly now sort of adds bits of vermiculite or pyrolite into it. Um, I don't know if, if you're still using biochar, Tolly, but you know, so you can add in other amendments if you need to make it sort of a bit freer draining or lighter. But effectively, it the main bulk of the material is just that is just composted wood chips sieved. The question about disease is, is interesting. I was really nervous when I started using wood chip about disease. Um, I, it's, and especially kind of, you know, I'm, mul I'm mulching trees basically. So you're thinking, okay, I'm taking potentially diseased trees and I'm, I'm mulching my trees. I've become much less worried about it as I've gone on. Uh, and there's a few reasons. So one is that diseases tend to attack old, weak, dying trees. They tend not to be the main cause of disease. Uh, I know we've mentioned that dieback, so I will come to that. But, you know, usually with most diseases, it's it's the dying trees that are the problem. Um, and your mulching, you tend to mulch your newly planted, vigorous, young, healthy trees. Um, so, so broadly, that's a good starting point. Secondly, um, the uh, you know, often diseases are quite specific or, or tend to, uh, you know, attack one tree rather than another. So scab, for instance, there are lots of different strains of scab and some of them will affect, uh, you know, one variety more than others. So if you, this is one of the advantages of having a mixed orchard, um, you'll slow the spread of disease across the orchard because, of, you know, this particular strain of scab that loves discovery won't be quite as virulent against ash meets kernel so you know when it hits that it slows down so even within uh you know within a species you'll have different strains of disease that might not affect the trees you've got as much as the one that they've come from the third point is that usually the spores of the disease are not carried in the wood chip um so often it's in the air uh, you know, so ash dieback, for instance, is everywhere. You, you know, we're not, we can't do anything about that. It, you're going to get it. It's not in the wood chip, usually. Um, there might be some, but not that much. And also, if you're composting it, those disease spores will very quickly break down. Um, so if you've got composted wood chip, the risk of disease, I would say, is almost nothing. So <clears throat> I'm not saying there's no risk. I'm not saying you couldn't have a disaster. Um, but I think generally, the risk is very low. Uh, and you know, particularly if you're then using it on vegetable beds, I think the risk is is you know pretty much zero because it's going to be different diseases that have affected the trees. Um, so so I think you know as with anything, if you you know if you're particularly worried about a particular batch, you know, and maybe it wouldn't be sensible to mulch all your fresh young ash trees with ash dieback, but to be honest, nobody's planting ash very much at the moment anyway. Um, so so I think generally don't worry about it, um, but it's not to say that you should forget about it totally um, and if you know if you get a batch that you're worried about then I would compost it before spreading it so uh, we've done a little bit of that so yeah I mean it it which it works really well in no-dig systems I think using it well composted would be my would be my preference um, and I think you know as with any soil amendment uh you know use in moderation um so it's a really good way of establishing a bed or mulching for the first few years you know i wouldn't be putting on 
thick layers of wood chip every year, uh, I think you would you would see imbalances starting to form. But you know, to put on the thick layer to start with to establish the system, and then a little sprinkling every year to keep it going, I think you know that probably is going to work and all be fine. Um, but you know, as with anything, monitor it, look at the health of the plants. If you start seeing problems, then um, you know, then change change what you're doing. Um, but you know, it's it's lower in uh, in nitrogen than than a lot of composts and manures. So I think you know the risk of sort of over manuring, I think, is reduced using wood chip. Um, but again, not to say it's without any risk. And certainly, you know, people like Charles Dowding have, have used wood chip and and you know see it as a very valuable and useful material for, for no dig systems. Uh, so you're all obviously totally enthused about it and desperate to get your hands on the stuff. Uh, apologies for the dog barking. Uh, so where can you get it? Uh, I've just realized I've got the American version of this slide on. I do apologize. That shouldn't say get chip drop. That should say ARB talk. Um, so there's a, there's a website called ARB Talk, which is run by tree surgeons. Um, and you can register yourself as a tip site. Um, so uh, the effect of you just go on, you say, yeah, I, you know, I'm up for getting some wood chip. Um, and you put in your postcode or your address. Uh, and it helps if you've got, you know, if you're easy access, if you've got a nice concrete pad, they can come and dump on. You know, if it's a tricky site, they're less likely to come to you. Um, you know, the reason I think we get a lot at Eastbrook is it's, you know, they can come in, there's no gates to open, it's easy to drive in, we've got a big concrete pad. You know, now that we know them, we're happy for them to just come in and dump whenever we don't have to be there. So it's really easy. For one of them, it's on his way home, so it just suits him. Um, you know, if you're in an awkward site and it's difficult to get to, it might be harder. Uh, and I have also heard uh, as a, just a slight word of warning that there are some unscrupulous people that use the site to case out joints for stealing kit. Um, so if you've got lots of expensive kit right near where you're getting it dropped, that might be worth bearing in mind. Um, or just being really sort of, you know, vetting the, the company that says they're going to drop it first. But, I, you know, hopefully that's the minority. I think mostly they're, they're good. Um, but if that's not an option for you, um, on a very small scale, you can buy it in little bags, 80 litres. Um, <clears throat> I'm guessing for most uh, CSAs, that's going to be prohibitively expensive, about £10 a bag. Uh, the next option is a tonne bag, which I've seen priced at anything between £60 and £150. Somebody's making some money on that. Um, again, I think, you know, for... For commercial purposes, I don't think that's really feasible. I think, you know, that's still aimed at, at garden market. Uh, sometimes power companies have to clear the lines. You know, they'll they'll clear the trees under, under power cables. And sometimes, I mean, often they just leave it nowadays, but sometimes they'll have um, stuff they need to clear. So keeping an eye on that or registering with, with power companies. Um, and then uh, Chloe, you'll recognize this. This is uh, Wakelands where they're effectively growing their own wood chip. And certainly I would say for, for farmers and CSAs, if you've got, you know, if you've got any space and then, then growing some of your own wood chip, I think is, is the best way to do it. You've got control, um, you know what's going into it. You can, you can look at single species, which is interesting. Um, you get the benefits of having the trees on your site as well. Um, so, you know, obviously there's still a cost to it. Uh, you, you have to buy or hire a machine in to deal with it. Um, but it's a pretty cost effective way of getting a really good material. Um, and you can do it without it taking up, you know, too much space. It's a good way of edging beds, creating microclimates. Um, so, you know, I would definitely recommend if you have, um, you know, if you have any land, it's a, it's a really good way of, of getting wood chippers to grow your own. Um, but for most of us, uh, you know, tree surgeons, I would say, still provide the bulk um, of wood chip. And then, you know, one thing that is worth thinking about, I think, particularly for CSAs, um, is looking at community chipping. This is Tolly, so this isn't actually community chipping. This is him dealing with his own. But it was a group of people and some wood chip, which illustrated the point. Um, you know, so so green waste composting effectively, or green composting with the which the councils do, 
you know, is to some extent is this, but there, it's got to a scale where the quality of the material is, is mostly pretty poor. Um, so getting green waste compost or green compost is, there's often plastic in it, there's usually glass in it, um, <clears throat> and there's a risk of amino pyrolid uh, weed killer in it. Whereas if you've got a small group, you know, your own community, your members, that could bring their own stuff to chip, or you could maybe, uh, you know, you could hire the chipper and go round to your members and chip their stuff and collect the wood chip. You know, I think there's some real potential ways, you know, they could bring some woody waste when they pick up their veg, if you've got somewhere to store it, you know, so there's, there's opportunities, I think, for collecting and creating a higher quality um, material than there is through the municipal collection schemes. So that's, I think that's something that's worth thinking about. And that's me. I hope I hope those of you that weren't already enthused are, are now equally as enthused as I am, or maybe not quite my level of obsession. But um, but yeah, I mean, I just I'm always amazed by how we can turn trees into effectively that you know that stuff is it's brilliant, um, and we don't do enough of it. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to rattle off a couple of quick questions. Um, <clears throat> some that went back right to the beginning. I've just mulched strawberries with fresh wood chip. Should I remove it? Uh, hmm. I don't know. It depends how old and big the wood chip is. Um, uh, and how old and vigorous the strawberries are. Um, I'd be tempted to take half of it off and monitor and do an experiment. It depends how many strawberries you've got. It's Jesse at Oakbrook Orchard. I don't know if you know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 they're quite shallow rooted, so it might be a problem, but equally you've mulched them, you haven't dug them in, so it shouldn't. I mean, the other thing you can do in that situation is to sort of give them a liquid feed. So you could sort of do a, a seaweed liquid feed or something on them, which would reduce the risk of, um, of, any, of any nitrogen rubbing. Um, I would say the risk is low, but it, you know, I would be nervous about saying you'll be absolutely fine. And then you come back to me again, that was a disaster. Why do you tell me that? Okay. And then we've got another one. Um, do you have any experience with managing wood chip or ramiel on pathways in market gardens? Any hot tips? I mean, I think on pathways it's kind of almost a no brainer. Um, I think, uh, you know, it reduces the damage you do. It keeps your boots clean. Um, it, you know, any, any negative effect that might be happening in the soil under the path, you know, is too far away from anything you're growing to, to impact your growing. So I would say, I would say definitely put it on paths and I would say probably put it thicker than you think, um, because it does break down quickly and you've got two options as it breaks down. Um, you know, you can either, once it's, um, composted a bit you can either then spread it from the path onto the soil to build up the soil afterwards or you can just keep topping up um, the path you know on top of the previous one and it will the other thing it would do you know it will improve the drainage on that path so you know if you've got paths that get a bit muddy or a bit waterlogged it will <clears throat> it will it will reduce that it'll, it'll improve the drainage in the soil so yeah i would say definitely do it okay um can you combine ramiel chip and hay meadow cuttings to make compost? Would you need to add anything? Uh, I mean, you can. Would you need to add anything? I mean, it'll, it depends how long you want. A lot of this stuff depends on how quickly you want a result. So, you know, almost any organic material, if you leave it in a pile for long enough, it will break down and, and become something useful. You know, even the worst compost heap eventually breaks down and becomes something useful. So. So it, it depends partly on the quality of the material you want and the speed at which you want it. Um, and I, I actually, I thought I had a slide with the Johnson Sioux reactor in it, um, which I just realized now that I didn't have, which is um, a, it's effectively a static composting system where you, you put pipes and create air channels through the heat and then you don't turn it. Um, and because basically fungi don't like being disturbed. So every time you turn your 
wood chip pile, you're breaking up the fungi and potentially damage, you know, damaging and reducing the activity of the fungi. By doing it in a static way, and you can either just have air channels which <clears throat> allow air to get in, or some systems actually have air pumped through those. So you're effectively modulating the sort of temperature and oxygen levels within the heat. And what they found, um, so Johnson and Sue are a couple in America that, that have developed this. What they found is that the diversity of microorganisms and fungi in the compost is much, much higher when it's done by their method than when you do it by a sort of traditional turning method. Um, but, it's, it, but it is a bit of a faff creating the heat. Um, you know, if you look at their video on how to do it, you've got to create this wire cage and you'll put the pipes in and you'll stack it and I mean they, they're doing it in desert conditions in America so then they, they need to water it as well um, in our plant that's not such an issue um, <clears throat> so so in terms of sort of mixing different materials I think you know mixing manure and wood chip is obvious because it's you know, it's a high nitrogen mixing hay would work you know, it would break down, I'm sure. I have no idea how long it would take or whether you'd end up with sort of strands of hay in it and you need to leave it. My guess is that the hay will break down more quickly than the wood chip. The advantage of wood chip as part of the mix is it, it helps to um, remove some of those compacted layers that you get in compost heap sometimes where there's no air because it's a sort of bulkier material. It's a bigger structure. It tends to allow more air movement and, and oxygen through the heat. So it tends to, to sort of break down more quickly. So I, you know, I definitely think that adding some wood chip to your compost system, you know, whatever system you're using will help. I don't have specific experience of hay and wood chip, but I would definitely say give it a go and see what happens. There's one question here um, on a slightly different topic on, on composting, whether there's been much research done into the effectiveness of fungally dominated wood chip compost to regenerate soil and carbon sequestering potential. I couldn't find much and I'd looked quite hard when I was researching the book. Uh, you know, I mean, I've got the evidence of my own eyes looking at Tolly's soil um, and, you know, the, the, you know, there's lots of fungi in there and, and looking at what happens when I've mulched the trees at the farm and seeing you know more mushrooms around the wood chip. I mean, it's you know not just sort of directly on the wood chip, but around the soil. So I think I think it definitely happens. Um, there is evidence about fungi sequestering carbon, um, but not related to wood chip. So I think there's still a lot of research needs to be done. Um, but instinctively, and sort of from my own observation, I think it's happening, and it, it does it. But how much, and compared to different composts, I, I have no idea. So a few more straightforward questions. If you plant a hedgerow, would you wood chip straight on top of the grass? Are there any trees you wouldn't use at all? And should you cover or sheet a pile of wood chip that you're composting? Okay, three questions. So yes, we are literally about the east, but we just put in two hedges and we are about to um, put the wood chip directly on top of the grass. Um, we are going to mulch as heavily as we can. Um, so again, you know, notwithstanding the sort of keeping it away from the base of the trees, we're going to try and put on, you know, a good 25, 30 centimetres of, of chip if we can. Um, and some of the perennial weeds will come up through that. But by that stage, I'm hoping the trees will be established enough and we'll get going that I don't need to worry. Um, so that's that's my plan with that. Uh, what was the second one? If you plant a hedgerow would you wood chip straight on top of the grass if you aren't sorry yeah, uh, are there any trees either. you wouldn't use at all any trees i wouldn't use at all. susie is having to juggle her, her childcare duties <laughs> with running this webinar so if she keeps disappearing that's fine she's doing an amazing job uh, are there any trees i wouldn't use at all uh, in terms of mulching no i think pretty much anything i mean there is when you're making compost um or, or sort of trying to create a, you know a nice material i would say you don't want too much conifer in there um and i think you know tolly normally says sort of 25 30 percent maximum as part of the mix i think but i think if you're mulching it really doesn't seem to matter much um there's some concerns about ph effect of certain wood chips from what i can find in in the research it's pretty hard to change the ph of your soil with wood chip um, and if you do, it's pretty short lived and would probably only be on the top layer. Um, you know, I think if you are, I don't know, if you're growing 
an ericaceous plant in a pot, you could probably put enough pine needles as a mulch in the pot to keep it acidic. But if you're trying to do it on the soil, the soil is pretty good at buffering that sort of stuff. So, so I think even if you've just got Leylandii, for instance, you could use that as a mulch around a tree without any problem. Um, the you know, and as I said, there are some wood chips like um, you know, like walnut or cedar that have these allopathic effects, which actually can be an advantage if you're trying to keep weeds down. Um, but uh, you know, if you're using them in animal bedding, for instance, that can be a problem. Um, so there's definitely some species to avoid uh, using with bedding. You know, anything that's got nasty thorns in, for instance. Um, but you know, for 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 pretty much all livestock, chickens, poultry, cows, sheep, you know, wood chip is a brilliant bedding material. Um, so, so yeah, in certain circumstances, there are some trees I wouldn't use, but pretty much every tree has some use. Um, and the final one was about covering, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's a good, good question. There is, there is some debate. Um, so the reason for covering would be to, well, I definitely wouldn't cover them while I'm, while I'm composting it to start with. I think um, it would get too dry uh, and, uh, and you want the fungal spores to come in. Um, so one of the reasons for covering compost is to stop leaching. Um, and in wood chip, that doesn't really seem to happen very much. Uh, I mean, you get a little bit of leaching, um, but not a lot. Um, so that's one thing to say, actually, is don't put your wood chip pile right next to a river or a pond because you might get a little bit of leaching that, that would damage soil life. But compared to a compost heap, you'll get very little leaching. Um, and if it rains really hard, you know, the water will run through it, but it doesn't take much with it because wood chip has this incredible ability to hold on to nutrients. So you don't get a lot lost. Um, so, so I would say during the composting process, certainly during the first composting process, I would keep it uncovered. Uh, I know that Tolly covers his propagation stage. So when he goes on to that second stage of it, the six months where he's doing it for propagation, he covers it. And that's because he doesn't want lots of weed seed in there um, when he's going to take it into a propagation system. So there's a, you know, there's a good reason for covering it at that point. Um, but obviously you are also, uh, you know, excluding oxygen when you're, when you're covering it so potentially you're reducing the biological activity in a in a covered compost heap um, but i would say generally i mean we certainly don't cover ours at the farm but then we tend to use it relatively quickly um, if you're mixing it with manure or with something high nitrogen then i would say there's probably a good argument for covering it to stop leaching um, but yeah i think it depends is probably the short answer but i would if it's just wood chip i probably wouldn't so I'm afraid we're going to have to finish there. We've 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 run out of time. Um, I don't know if you've got any last gems of wisdom, Ben. You want to I don't add any last gems of wisdom? But I, I did just want to plug the Facebook group, um, which is the Woodchip for Soil Health group, which um, has got some really great information. Tolly's quite active on there. Um, so if you are on Facebook, there's there's a really good one, and there's also another American um, group called the Ramiel Chip wood group or something which is great as well run by someone else but yeah um but yes no other no other words of wisdom thank you ever so much ben that was absolutely fascinating i've learned loads i hope everyone else has uh, i'll send you all out an email with the links that have, that ben's mentioned and some of the links that have been put in the chat um yeah do get in touch with us uh, if you want to contact ben and um Thank you and have a nice rest of your evening. Uh, thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.